Good morning. Good morning. Is the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad. Amen? Yeah. Amen. I know I'm probably the only one who enjoys this weather, but I think this is beautiful. So it is wonderful to have you all here. My name is Mike. I am the pastor here at Shepherd of the Hills, and it is a glorious day to have you in worship, and I'm so glad you're here. And I especially want to welcome you if you are new or just been a while since you've been here. It is a blessing to have you here, and we hope you are blessed to be here. If you are new, uh, we've got these communication cards in the pew in front of you. Go ahead and fill out as much as you feel comfortable with, and we'll keep you up to date on everything that's going on. You can just drop it in the offering basket in the back. Speaking of the offering basket, if you would like to give an offering to support our ministry here at Shepherd of the Hills as we seek to glorify God here in Washington County and across the world, you can either do that through the offering basket there, or if you just text GIVE to that number up there, you'll get a secure giving link. It's easy, and it's safe, and it's secure. It's a great way to do that. Also, want to let you know two other important things. First of all, if this is your normal worship time and you would never dream of going to church as late as 10.30 a.m., you don't need to worry. But in two weeks, if you're a person who's ambidextrous and likes to go to both services, uh, in two weeks on the 28th, it's Richfield Parade Days, and so we are not having the 10.30 service simply because you can't get in and out of the parking lot on the 28th. So uh, 8.30 is going to be as normal, but no 10.30 on that day. Also, want to let you know that we love to help you and have you help in worship. One of the things I really believe is that worship is a team sport, and it's so meaningful and so wonderful to have more people up here. And there's a couple different parts of that. First of all, the day at 9.30, we're having worship assistant we're going to change the nomenclature on that. Assisting minister, the people like Sandy, who are kind enough to help and uh, lead worship up here. We are having a training for you guys. If you have been doing it or are you thinking about doing it or thought, you know, I wonder what that's like. We'd love to see you in the conference room at 930, just right over there. Grab yourself a cup of coffee and a treat and we will see you there. It is a great way to help worship and it's a great way to get more out of the worship service. Next week, we will be having communion, uh, a communion helper and lector training. So if you've ever thought, you know, I really love communion, and I love being part of that, and I love feeling God's grace through that, and you want to help share that with other people, we would love to have you be part of that. There's no commitment. You come, you check it out. We would love to train you in that. You could experience it. It's going to be next week at 9.30 for both, and if also you'd like to read. So if you're one of those people who loves the spoken word, who loves to use that and loves to hear God's word, love to have you be part of that. Next week, 9.30, it's gonna be awesome. So that is all the announcements I have for this morning. If you would please rise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please remain standing for our opening song.
Let us together confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you taught us that your Son fulfills, that love fulfills the law. Inspire us to love with all of our hearts, our soul, and our mind. Our strength and teach us how to love our neighbor as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated and we will hear our reading. Today's reading is from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 through 22. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judea, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were 
Ephorites from Bethlehem, Judea, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they lived there for about 10 years, both Malan and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judea. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another's husband. Or another husband. <laughs> then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I, too, am old. I'm too old to have another husband, even if I thought there was still hope for me. Even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. And as they wept aloud again, and then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me be it ever so severely, even if death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Deb. Uh, at this point, we're going to dismiss the kids for Children's Church. I realized I forgot to do that for the reading. So if you have a four-year-old through an eight-year-old who is looking for a little more kinetic message, we can just send them out with Karen, and they'll be back after the sermon. And we are swapping things around a little bit today because the special music, I want to do it after the sermon because it really matches up with parts of the sermon, and we want to give that a foundation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do the sermon hymn now. So if you'd please rise, we will sing.
ahead and be seated. So this morning, what I want to do is explore this story that Deb just read for us. This is one of those fascinating Old Testament stories that we just don't talk a lot about. It's this little tiny story, and it's got big implications, and it's this beautiful piece of literature that captures all these heartwarming moments, and at the same time, it's tearful, and it's challenging, and we don't know it as well as we should. And so we're going to spend the next four weeks looking at it. This is the book of Ruth. And as the first line says, this takes place in the time of Judges. And what that means is it takes place in this 300-year period between when God brings the people of Israel out of slavery, out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, through the wilderness, into the Promised Land, and before God establishes the kings of Israel. So you get about 300 years, roughly 1300 B.C. to 1000 B.C. So it takes place about 3,000, 3,300 years ago. It takes place towards the end of that period. And so that period, if you're not real familiar with it, was, um, I'm trying to think of the proper adjective for that one, it was a wild period of time. It's probably the most polite thing I can say. You probably don't hear me preach on the book of Judges, well, rarely. I'll put it rarely. And that's not because I don't love the book of Judges. I love the book of Judges. It's one of my favorites. But you know how when you're watching a movie or a movie trailer and they say the following movie is rated R for extreme violence, uh, graphic uh, language, and they lift off about six or eight other things? That's the book of Judges right there. The book of Judges earns its R rating, okay? Which is kind of why I love it. Uh, and I'll do that one for Bible study in a heartbeat. But I usually don't preach on it. And so that's the backdrop of this story. This story is PG rated, but the backdrop, hard R, right there, okay? So this place, this story, taken place then. And the story starts out with this gentleman by the name of Elimelech living in Bethlehem. Now, one of the things to pay attention to, oftentimes in the Bible, names mean something. And in this story, pretty much everybody who's got a name, it means something. Okay, So Elimelech means, my God is my king. And he's saying that in a time when there's no king of Israel. He's like, this is the guy who's in charge. I answer only to God. God is my ruler. Okay, That's what his name means. And he's living in the town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem goes back a long time. This is the same town that Jesus is born in a thousand years later. Same town you can still go to today. Bethlehem means house of bread. Anytime you see that Beth in a name in the Bible, it means house of. So Bethel, house of God. Bethlehem, house of bread. So you'd think in a place like called house of bread, there would be lots of food. Normally, yes. Not at this time. There's a famine in the land, so there is no food in the house of bread. Take your irony on that one. So Elimelech says to his wife and his two sons, we're going to get out of here. We're going to go over to the, town, to the country of Moab. And so it's just to the east of Israel. You just go across the, Jerusalem, excuse me, the Jordan River, and it is like slumming it with your... Not your trashy cousins, but your definitely downscale cousins, okay? You see, the Moabites were descendants of Lot and Lot's daughters. So they're cousins of the Israelites. So you go back to Genesis, you can trace out the lineage. And the Israelites, well, it's like, okay, well, they can't go worship in the temple, but you're not forbidden to intermarry, okay? A lot of the you know, the Hizites and the other tribes, you were forbidden to intermarry and they couldn't go into the temple. But these guys are like, eh. when I was growing up in Minnesota, we always looked down our noses at the Iowans. And if you're from Iowa, I know I should apologize, but I'm not going to. Some things I just never repent of. Um, oh, come on, get me going. I'll tell you lots of Iowa jokes. But anyway, but the reality is, is 
Minnesota and Iowans, we were all cousins, okay? And there's not a whole lot of difference between the two. And so that's pretty much the way the Israelites looked at the Moabites. It's like we look down our nose at them, but we're really realizing that there's not a ton of difference, aside from the religion angle, because the Moabites did have their own gods. So, but this is unusual for a couple of reasons. First of all, that they're going to live among the Moabites because they're going to live among a, pretty much a pagan people. But here's the bigger reason this is unusual. This is a time in world history when everybody is a substance farmer. And what that means is what you grow is what you're living on. And that's it. It's what everybody did. Nobody went to the big city and earned a living as a shoemaker or a banker or anything else. Nobody worked in the factories. That did not happen until like the 1800s and the Industrial Revolution. That time and place, pretty much that time, most times, most places, you lived on what you grew, and that was it. Maybe you had a little extra to sell at the end of the year, but not much. And so your land had been passed down from generation to generation to generation since the people of Israel were brought into that land, which at this point was probably a couple hundred years. So Elimelech is taking his land and he's selling it to somebody else and he's going to Moab and he's going to try and make a go of it there. So for somebody to say, my God is king, he's moving on. Now then, so Elimelech and Naomi, his wife, which means pleasant or sweetness, and their two sons go over to Moab. And the two sons marry two Moabite girls named Orpah and Ruth, and they live there. And then the story takes a dark turn because, you know, a famine's not dark enough. Elimelech dies, and then the two sons die. And so you got these three widows living in Moab. Now, it is never a good time to be a widow, ever. But in this time and place, it is a particularly bad time to be a widow. The reason that the Old Testament talks so much about widows and orphans is because these people had no economic security. These people never knew how they were going to live. Their husbands and their families were their means of sustenance, and that's gone. And so all the insecurity that you could imagine, all the uncertainty, all the just, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? slams down on these three like a cement truck. And so Naomi says, I'm going to go back home to Judah. And her two daughters-in-law, first they say, we're going to go with. And Naomi says to both of them, look, go back home. Go back to your families. Go back to your gods. Go back to what you did before. And Orpah gives, mom, gives Naomi a big hug and says, yeah, I'll go back home. But Ruth doesn't. And that's these famous words. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And it is this beautiful little, I don't know, speech is almost too strong, but this declaration of her saying, wherever you go, I'm going to go. And it is this bit of faithfulness that we still talk about 3,000 years later. And Ruth, as I said, everybody's name in this story means something. Ruth means friend. And so they go back to Judah. A couple of things I want to pull out of this. A couple pieces of the story that I just want to, want to lift up for you to ponder. Because this is just a great piece of literature. 
And I don't say it's a great piece of fiction. I'm saying it's a great piece of literature. And we can read the story and listen to the story and learn from it. And the first thing I want to take a look at, the first thing I want to say is just a little bit different, a little bit odd about this story, is God doesn't show up in this story. And I know your natural reaction is, how can God not be in this story? It's in the Bible. I mean, that's kind of a good question, isn't it? Here's what I mean. We read the Bible, and we expect supernatural stuff. We expect angels. We expect visions. We expect dreams. We expect miracles. We expect those things. Most of us don't live in that every day. You might have had some new supernatural experience. Does it happen today? Absolutely. Do people see visions and dreams and angels and miracles occur? Absolutely. Totally agree with that. Bless you. But most of us don't live that every day. And I've known plenty of people who've seen visions, who've encountered angels, who've had miracles happen. But most of them will tell you it doesn't happen to them every day. And so most of us are left in this world where God chooses to remain anonymous. And we use words like providence and circumstance or God working through others. And that's important for us to understand because just because we can't see it doesn't mean God's not at work. Now, as we get deep into the story, we're going to see God at work. And we're going to see God's faithfulness reflected in characters, in people. But as we just read through it, God's choosing not to show himself. And that's something that we have to understand for our lives. Something that we have to understand as we go through in this world. That sometimes we have to understand that we're not going to get those visions or those dreams or those supernatural signs. Let me tell you a story. As most of you know, I went through this experience with colon cancer this year. And I will freely admit that from about Thanksgiving of last year to about the 4th of July of this year is just kind of a blur. So if I said anything strange or anything I need to apologize for, just let me know. We'll take care of that. Okay? It's a blur. But there's a few things I remember. And I will tell you this. I went through eight chemo treatments. And if you've ever had the unpleasant experience of chemotherapy, and I know a number of you in this room have, and I know a number of you have dealt with worse things than I have, it's no picnic. They hook you up to an IV, and you sit there in the chair for a couple hours. In my case, it was a couple hours. And I went home and felt miserable for a couple of days. After about a week, I'd feel back to myself, and I'd start to do it again. But I remember going in for number treatment number four out of eight. And I remember leading up to that treatment just feeling so depressed and frustrated because I knew I wasn't halfway through. And it was that I am going to have to do this and I'm not even halfway through, and it feels so dark, and it feels like it's never going to end. And as I tell you that, I'm sure pretty much everybody in this room has had some similar circumstance. Not necessarily chemo, but something else where you feel like it is just this darkness that is never going to to end. And if you've never been there, you're a lucky person. But the thing is, that's where most of the people in the Bible live. 
living in that period of waiting and hope and knowing that someday God will bring them out of this. Someday there will be deliverance. Someday there will be redemption. But as they're in the midst of the storm, they don't know how long it's going to last. They don't know how long they're going to be there. And you get things like the book of Hebrews talking about all these people waiting and waiting and waiting. Moses waits, Abraham waits, Noah waits, the judges wait, all these people wait. You get the time of Jesus, people who have been waiting there at the temple for the Savior to be born, and they're waiting. And they're waiting in hopefulness. And the thing we do when we're waiting when we're down, is we take encouragement from the people who've gone before. Friends, I have to tell you, one of the things that really bore me up in that time, one of the things that really helped me was hearing the stories from you all. We have way more people here than I realized who've gone through cancer. And it was always so encouraging to be able to share a cup of coffee with people and say, hey, did you experience this? Uh, do your feet still like tingle? And they're like, yeah. So, oh, okay, good. I'm not the only one. Um, but yeah, just getting the encouragement from people who've gone through it before and say what you're going through isn't crazy. And let me pray that God will give you strength. The only way I got through and so for those of you who are in those times now, I want to encourage you and help you to remember God's faithfulness. See, this is one of the most beautiful parts of the most quoted parts. Well, it is the most quoted part of this book. What Ruth says, where you go, I go. Where you rest, I rest. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And it is this beautiful expression of faithfulness. And what she is saying is a reflection of God's character. You see, there is this concept in the Bible of God's faithfulness. There's a Hebrew word, kesed, which talks about that. And one of the interesting things, one of the things I learned a long time ago was we always make these jokes that Old Testament is God of wrath and God's always boiling oceans and turning rivers to blood and just being angry, okay? But the more you read the Old Testament, the more you see God's steadfast love, God's faithfulness, God's grace, God's mercy present everywhere. And that culminates in the birth of Jesus. You see, the thing is, it's not our faithfulness. Hosea has this great line. He says, like our faithfulness. Well, he's talking about the nation of Israel. But really, he's talking about us as human beings. He says, nation of Israel, faithfulness, it's like the morning fog. You look, and it looks great. And ten minutes later, it's gone. God's faithfulness lasts forever. You see, that's what we get all throughout the Bible. God's always faithful. God's always loving. There's this beautiful peace everywhere. Even Jacob, in the, old, in, uh, the book of Genesis, Jacob is a scoundrel, okay? Even what the scoundrel, it's even what his name means. So those of you named Jacob, I'm sorry. Parents need to do a little more research. I can't be held responsible, okay? Okay. But what goes on here is Jacob is a scoundrel. And then he goes through all these years, and he realizes what he is. And he says, God, I'm sorry. And he apologizes to the people he's wronged, tries to make amends. But God is faithful to him all throughout that. You get the people of Israel... Sometimes they're faithful, sometimes they're not. Book of Judges is a prime example. 
They do these awful things. God punishes them. They repent. They call out to God. God loves them all throughout this. God never stops loving. And for those of you going through those dark times, whether you're going through it now or you're going to go through it in the future, because I can pretty much guarantee you're going to get it at some point, you need to be reminded of that. You need to be loved by that. One of the things I learned a long time ago was oftentimes preaching isn't so much about telling you new stuff, more about reminding you of what you already know. And I want to remind you of God's faithfulness and God's steadfast love. I want to do this for you this morning. There's this beautiful psalm, Psalm 136. And it's built this interesting way. There's a line, and then there's the same response. There's a line, and there's always the same response. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's try this as a congregation. I'll read you a line. You respond, for, for his steadfast love endures forever. Okay, to him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 136, I want you to meditate on that. I want you to think about that. It is this beautiful reminder of how God's steadfast love. And whatever darkness you're enduring, whatever trials you're facing, whatever dislocations, whatever foreign lands you're in, remember God's steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Now, as I said earlier, we have special music for us today. And just to give you a little bit of the backstory, when I put this on the preaching schedule a couple of months ago, Cynthia looked at the schedule and said, we are doing this piece of special music on this day. And we all know I don't argue with Cynthia because she's always right, okay? She's been doing this job a long time and she's really good at it. So I want to invite our musicians forward and these words that you're going to hear are based, they're slightly different translation, but they're based on what Ruth says to Naomi. So...
do so to me and more also if art but death part thee and me if art but death part thee and me thy people shall be Thank you, Kristen. Let us together celebrate our common faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his Holy Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. Your response will be hear our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain your church. We pray for all who dedicate their lives to serving your people. Renew our commitment to our friends in faith around the globe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain your creation. We pray for all places affected by natural disasters. Fill heaven and earth with your life-giving spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Arise, O God, and sustain those who are oppressed. You made us in your image. Grant us grace to stand against evil and help us to use our freedom rights to establish justice in our communities and among the nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Arise, O oh God, and sustain this church. We pray for this community, celebrating with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. In our joy and in our tears, be near us. Together, let's pray for Aidan Highsmith, son of Mike and Candy Highsmith, for ongoing gastrointestinal problems, and for Shirley Tice for successful second cataract surgery. Also, Linda Weiss, who is currently hospitalized. Let's also pray for our brothers and sisters at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Lebanon. We pray that God would bless them and pour out the Holy Spirit on their community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, help us to remember to count what you have provided in our life. Show us the people you have placed in our life. Thank you for allowing us to support and serve others around us. We want to acknowledge what you have given us rather than focus on what seems lacking. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed our right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the choirs of angels and the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people. Do this for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so together we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The table is now ready. We believe that all those who believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior are welcome. The ushers will direct you up the center aisle or up the side aisle and just return down the outside. And uh, we have the gluten-free bread available for everyone. And we believe that all those who believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior are welcome. Children who have not yet received communion instruction are more than welcome to come forward for a blessing. Please be seated. And if the community assistants would step over here, we'll commune them first.
If you'd please rise. We don't take communion as a collection of individuals, but we take communion knit together in what God has done for us, knit into one body, the church. And so receive this blessing. May this heavenly food, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace until he comes again. Amen. Now, our worship does not end, but it does change form. And as we go into this world, we worship with everything that we have and everything that we are. And we do so until we come back together and worship as a body, whether here in person or online. And so as you go, take this benediction with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain standing for our last song. <laughs>